I'm Siddharth Cantamani. I'm the Director of Photography. I mean, I love making movies. Even a bad day on a movie set is a good day. Um, the nightmares are like, like I said, there's real, very real things about safety that, you know, sometimes corners get cut and, you know, it's at a point where like, that's never okay. Um, but no, I think, I think usually the like quirky, silly problems are just like, oh, we're not on the same page and like, that's not possible, but we'll figure out how to make it work. I mean, a challenge on a movie set is still an exciting day working on like the thing I've wanted to do since I was a little kid. But I think my proudest moment as a DP was when I, you know, got a call one day from the Guild president saying that I'd won an award and I really, I mean, I was excited for myself and I was proud of myself and I think I did a good job in that movie, but I was really proud to be able to call the crew, every member of the crew and be like, hey, you guys won this award. Um, and I think seeing that movie at the screening with, you know, it was a big screening out in Hollywood, like at the Director's Guild and that kind of thing. And it was alongside some really good, fantastic movies. Um, and I still keep up with the DPs that shot those. But at the end of our movie, you know, we'd been, I was third or fourth in line and I'd watched all the credits for the previous movie. And it was like, oh, these are like 60 person union crews working on all these short films. And then my movie came up that was also screening at a red carpet event at the DGA and that kind of thing. And it was like 15 people that we'd all gone to college together and made movies in like dorm rooms and backyards. And I was like, okay, this is cool. Like, it was like a little bit of an extra pat on the back to be like, oh, my friends and I just made a thing that's as qualified, as good as, as this like industry standard thing. You know? Specifically speaking about Georgia, there was like a funny moment around that because first off, it was early enough um, it was 2014, so it was early enough that like people were still, I, I guess, in denial about there being movies in Georgia, right. <laughs> in California. Like, oh, what's it like to work in Atlanta? I was like, I don't know, man. Every movie in the theater is being yeah, shot there, yeah, so it's fine. Great. Um, but our movie was actually about the Russian-Georgian War, mm -hmm. so I had this moment with. Uh, two Oscar-winning DPs came up to me and were just like, what was it like shooting in Georgia? And the whole week I'd been like defending Atlanta filmmakers and been like, it's fine, we have professionals in Atlanta. <laughs> and they were like, what was it like filming in Georgia? Was it hard? And I was like, no, it's great. Everybody's professional. We, we have all the same resources. And they were like, but the language barrier. Well, since the movie was in Russia or in Georgia and the language spoken was Russian and Georgian, they thought that we'd shot in Georgia, at which point I immediately like clarified that we were just shooting in Atlanta down the, we were at like a Briarcliff campus at Emory. Um, okay. There was, um, I called my production designer and was just like, hey, two Oscar winning DPs said I need to hold on to my production designer because they thought we'd shot in like Eastern Bloc, Georgia. So I was like, okay, great. That's, so that's like not really about my, per that's, I mean, I think I did a good job photographically, but I had the perfect crew for that. So as far as how the opioid epidemic has affected my life, um, I'm lucky to say that, you know, my immediate family, I, I don't have that experience. And I do say lucky because growing up in rural Alabama, I was very aware of the impact it was having on families around me, people in the community, um, not just because of where I live, but also the fact that I had a family member, my father works in healthcare and I grew up my whole life around hospitals, that kind of thing. Hospitals in kind of the biggest small town in an area surrounded by just rural areas that were still agricultural or had lost their industry or that kind of thing. So that's kind of prime territory that you see a lot of these problems. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I was very aware growing up that this was kind of a constant epidemic and I think Alabama is some of the worst statistics in the country or something, so. Well, um, I mean, I work on a lot of short films and kind of the result of that 
in a place like Atlanta is that there's such kind of a thriving indie scene and there's a quality level that like I've not had the opportunity to work on a lot of short films because like you work on some and it's doing well and we're kind of getting work and there's a lot of work on like major stuff going around um, so the time to work on these independent films where you have more control and more kind of room to experiment is limited and um, you know you and I have worked together and know yeah. each other socially but um, it's been a long time since we've been able to work together on a, on a project but no I think the thing about Life Finder that's interesting is like there's a heart to it like it's still a movie it's still entertainment but there's a heart to it there's a serious story here um, and knowing that a filmmaker you know is coming with a project that like actually means something to them isn't like this is cool this would sell this would you know for whatever reasons that are anything other than sincere and like you can make movies that are cool and will sell for sincere reasons i'm not saying that but you know you cared about the project you told me um you know a little bit of the story the true stories that inspired the project so like that's kind of like check one like this script means something it's actually has like a human element to it and then beyond that like you know just when we had our conversation about the look of the film and it's not just hey i need a i need a camera guy. i need somebody that can light this and make the actors look pretty and point a camera at them it was you know from our first meeting you're the one that brought up like how we didn't want the camera to be just literally capturing what's happening the same way that like every TV show that we see does it but like how can the the way the camera moves and the way the scene is lit really emulate not just the literal telling of the story but the emotional telling of the story and like you know there's we've talked about using the perspective of each character's kind of emotional state to dictate you know how the party scene at the beginning of the movie is lit. You know, when Blair comes charging in and she's frantic and she has, you know, this singular goal of saving her little sister, we've talked about like how to emulate that as like almost a tunnel vision effect and how to selectively light her sister on the couch, even in a crowded party and maybe even shut out all other imagery um, in a way that would, is, is almost like theatrical in a stage sense but it's really just like, no, that's what an older sibling is feeling when they don't care about anything else in the world. They're saving that person. Um, and then doing lighting effects and lensing effects that um, demonstrate kind of the, the lack of focus and the confusion that happens, whether it's in these moments of fear or it's in moments of like substance abuse and how to affect that. Um, we talked about like how the past could be shot one way in a more kind of looser feeling and not just like nostalgia for nostalgia's sake, but like what about their more youthful kind of freewheeling rock and roll lifestyle can be emulated by a handheld feel or a certain, a certain kind of like wandering focus feel versus current Blair and Adam being more static and clean and like we've, we've minimized and we've kind of sort of structured life a little bit more and how the camera can reflect that. So honestly, you know, just having a conversation with somebody that says like, I'm telling a story that I care about and I care about the way it looks in a way that is actually unique to the story and not just, I want to make it look like that because that's doing well right now. Or even because that's how I think it's supposed to look because that's the only thing I ever see. The, the opportunity to make something new, the opportunity to make something meaningful. That's, that's why this is an interesting project. Okay, so I'll eat just about anything that's at Crafty ever, which is the problem, which is why Crafty is actually terrifying for me because I eat like a 13 year old on movie sets. I drink soda, which I never drink outside of movie sets and I eat all the candy in the world, which I don't eat, you know, but just when I'm on set, something happens and I, I, I ate a bowl of corn pops at three in the morning on set two weeks ago. I haven't done that in 15 years. So honestly, like I am excited when there's like a bag of apples on set.
because I know that I'm gonna keep on going to Crafty, like I know that I have no control about that. Like if we have five minutes between takes, I'm gonna run to Crafty and grab whatever I can. So at least if there's like, I, I, it just happened last year, I just realized like, I'm just gonna eat apples. I'm just gonna be that guy. And whether as a cameraman or even as a director on some sets, I was just sitting in Video Village just eating apples. And, and somehow that's become my like on set, like saving, <laughs> saving grace of Good Crafty. To know. So no corn pops. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm not saying don't have corn we'll pops. Have I'm just saying have we'll apples have, too. The good and the bad. We'll have to put the two next to each other. Right. And just every <laughs> time I get to craft, you have to check and choose, and I start sweating and pulling my collar and stuff. Perfect.